I'm not dead. That sounds like something interesting. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rick Dancer. Welcome to Rick Dancer TV. Obviously, we're in the mood like you probably are too for plants, spring planting, summer planting. We're at Johnson Brother Greenhouses. This is Caleb Johnson. You're too young to be a Johnson Brother because they're my age. You must be a Johnson Brother son. Exactly. You're new to this. You gave up a career in banking. What, yep. what were you thinking? Well, uh, after spending seven years working with lots of business owners, I just felt like it was the perfect opportunity to jump in and have the freedom to do my own thing. And my wife and I decided to make the move down here and join the family business. Don't you think a lot of people are looking for that sense of freedom where you have control of your own destiny, your own job, and you're your hours are worse when you have own your own business. Oh yeah, I thought it was going to be better, but we actually are uh, working seven days a week out here, so. But it's yours. It's but your it's family's. exactly, exactly. Okay, I live in the country. You're now my plant guy, mm -hmm. so you need to help me. I have deer, so yeah. I need something that the deer don't like as much as I do. Yeah, well, I've got a couple options for you. One, okay. uh, we actually have this dwarf pomegranate. Also comes in a tree form, so something fun, a little different, a little tropical. Uh, but the deers don't like it. Uh, we also have heuchera, which comes in a few different colors. Uh, it's also known as coral bells and gets a great little uh, flower on it as well. So that's deer resistant, blooms year round. That's a great, great product. You guys have a real variety out here. So what's the weirdest plant you have? Rick, you want weird? What in the heck is that? You know what that looks like? It looks like something off the little shop of horrors. What is that? Well, Rick, this is actually agave. You mean tequila. How am I going to fit that in my TSX? Well, you're not going to fit this one in, but I do have a couple other options for you. Here's a couple different flavors of, uh, of agave right here. These are the half shots <laughs> for, exactly. the, for the homeowner, exactly. right? Exactly. All right, Caleb, thanks. You can't go anywhere in Lane County for sure, and probably as far as Salem, uh, that has the selection that we do. Well, it started in uh, 1978. We started raising peppers and tomatoes for outdo outdoor field production for our uh, family farm. Before 78, we were in the field together, uh, you know, farming. And uh, I, I left for Tektronics. It was a big electronic firm. And, and he said, Vern, I, I think that we could make some money growing indoors. Oh, you're nuts. So I gave up my my good, I was single at the time and gave up a good job with benefits to come down. Just, just left it uh, on a whim, on a wing and a prayer to, and to, to see if we could uh, actually pull this off. My grandma took down to the old Fifth Street Public Market uh, with a horse and carriage. Yeah, they actually grew a, a garden that was so big they didn't know what to do with it, so they took it down. She was a baker, so she took baked goods and then my grandpa had the garden and she threw it on the the buggy and took it down. I thought there was no money in flowers. We kind of poo-pooed it. <laughs> and we were wrong. And people driving by, going out probably to Dieterings, of all places, they, we actually had the color out by the road. And some ladies stopped in. We had no sign, no till, no nothing. And they said, do you sell to the public? And we looked at each other, yeah, why not? <laughs> and that's how it started. We did not put up a sign. We did not advertise for at least three years. And they just kept coming in, all word of mouth. We as people need to connect to nature. We, we love beauty. We like things that, that grow and, and give us color. Imagine you're in the backyard and you're having a barbecue. And all around you, you got a couple hanging baskets, you got some flowers and some pots flowing, overflowing. You've got the texture and colors against your house and around your patio. That enhances people's lives. I, and I can be a part of that. And I, and I feel good about that. Now take all that away and just imagine gravel. I mean, it's sterile. It's part of being back in the Garden of Eden, so to speak. Good growing is a result of paying attention to details. Uh, we're not afraid to spend a little money. Uh, that means, uh, you know, giving enough water, nutrients, 
light and space. A lot of commercial greenhouses pack them a little too tight and uh, I just don't do that. We just give them more, more room and space. It warms my heart when people have the confidence to say uh, this is the place to buy plants. This next story is going to irritate you. I hope it irritates you to the point of taking some action. We went out with Lane County's nuisance abatement program. The woman you're about to meet goes out with a truck and picks up old mattresses, used adult dirty diapers, anything that's left on the side of the road. Here's how you can help her clean up Lane County. This is how we like to think of Lane County, not this. Illegal dump sites are a growing problem in rural Lane County. You don't have to go far outside any city to find them. I think it's frustrating for all of us. On this day, we find nuisance abatement specialist Carolyn Francis cleaning up one of the largest illegal dump sites in the county just west of Cottage Grove. A little bit of trash tends to attract more trash. So I, we, it's best to know, you know, as soon as I know about stuff, I like to get out there and get it cleaned up and stay on top of it. If she doesn't stay on top of it, a trash bag becomes a magnet for more trash, and soon you end up with this. Volunteers come out to help. Cleaning up other people's garbage. The, I enjoy shooting as much as anybody, but I, it bothers me to see a mess like this. A Lane County Sheriff's work crew, the Bureau of Land Management, and private landowners like Warehouser are also on hand. Tom Hewlett says illegal dumps are a huge problem for landowners. Over the last couple of decades, little by little, Warehouser's been closing down their property, and the reason for it is, is uh, the theft of equipment, theft of timber, the litter, and uh, just the people that abuse the property. At the end of the day, 40 yards of illegal trash is removed. That's four and a half tons of illegally dumped garbage and 70 tires. Since the nuisance abatement program started in 2006, 1,130 illegal dump sites have been cleaned up. That's 255 tons of trash, 3,500 tires, 200 appliances, and more than 1,000 TVs and monitors, 255 sofas, and 154 mattresses. 62 citations are issued for littering. You can kind of see the clusters of the problem areas. Back in our office, Francis shows us the map. This is a map that we started um, when we first started the program in 2006, and the red pins are the large dump sites. That's only for two years, and I stopped because I couldn't fit any more pins in those same spots. I take reports of illegal dumps um, on Lane County roads. I investigate them, dig through the trash, try to figure out who did it, write tickets for it. I can also require them to clean it up. There's a garbage bag right on a Lane County road. Sure enough, right in the bottom of the bag, a bank receipt with the name and account number of the owner of this trash. And if you look, most of this is recycling. Here's newspaper. This is recyclable. Most of this stuff is. Um, so, really, there's no excuse for it to be on the side of the road. Francis says 75% of the illegal trash she finds is recyclable. I love my job. I would have never guessed that this is what I was going to do, but um, I really do like keeping Lane County roads clean and trying to hold illegal dumpers accountable for their behavior. At the next site, a mattress and adult diapers. That's all diapers. The people of Lane County are Frances's eyes and ears. She can't do this without you. They're the biggest help to me because they keep a close eye on the road and they call in stuff. Um, you know, a lot of times they'll even come out when I'm cleaning it up and thank me and, you know, appreciate that, that we do what we do. It's a never ending job. Frances sees improvement in some areas, but illegal dumpers find new spots, new surprises, and the only way to stop them is to keep watching. Down the road, the remains of someone's bathroom remodel. Most of it's recyclable. This mess would have cost less than $10 to take to the landfill. If illegal trash is traced back to you, it's your problem and you're fine, whether you put it there or not. 
from the time you generate the trash until it's recycled or disposed of properly, you're responsible. So when you hire somebody else, it's still something you chose to do. And so if your trash is in the woods, then you're still responsible. Francis says if you hire someone to haul your trash, even if it's a family member or friend with a truck, don't pay them until you see a receipt from an official landfill. That way you know the trash was dumped legally. Also, she says, protect yourself and pay with a check. The best way you can help is if you're traveling down a road and you see garbage, um, call it in as soon as, you, as soon as you see it. And if you're hauling trash to the landfill, tarp it. It will save you money when you get there and it'll keep your trash from accidentally ending up alongside a road, which can cost you several hundred dollars in fines. Scott, Scott, Emma's finally here. She made it on her little, wa little green it. wagon. What took you so long? The wagon. Did you get stopped in Coburg? <laughs> no, they, they couldn't catch me. <laughs> did you see that story we did on the nuisance abatement program? Yeah, Captain Cleanup. Look at that. <laughs> That's Carolyn's new name. Yeah, I guess so. She's a superhero. Hey, we're at Johnson Brothers Greenhouses, mm -hmm. and I have arranged for you to learn how to arrange a pot. I see what you're doing and, there. Yeah, right? get it. <laughs> Let's do this. And we are out here at Johnson Brothers Greenhouses, and I met Marie. She agreed to show me how she goes about arranging these flowers, or making arrangements, I guess. What I start with is about half of it being filled up with dirt. That way it gives it a nice foundation. Then you want to start with something tall. So it's going to be kind of your line flower. You could use grass, which is a really nice texture. And it's a really filler, kind it of? It fills. It's really great, so you could put that right there. You can put this right here so it has adds color it matches Ooh, really well look at that that's kind of metallic mm -hmm. and then you can do something that doesn't get super tall but it kind of fills in really nice so you could put that right there petunias lantana would be awesome and in this way you could just turn it different directions yep. and it's a different plant altogether you could do fill it in with things that are going to drape more so you can put it right there and it Looks just nice. fills in and all you the way around all the arrangements out here is that yeah, all you i okay. do i do um the planters and uh fresh cut flowers so come out check them out johnson brothers greenhouses So, if you didn't know, I work for some radio stations here in town, Rock 97.9 KNRQ and 96.1 KZL, and the guys like to make fun of me. A lot. For being unconventional. I went to my favorite place, Goodwill, and found some unconventional ways to uh, pot some plants. Check this out. And when we come back, I'll show you, or tell you, how to win some professionally potted plants. So it's springtime, and if you're like me, you're in the mood to plant some flowers, but those are boring. I'm not that conventional, so I went to Goodwill to find something different. Grab this, $2.99, $2.99, and 50 cents. Planting snobs are doing, she's doing that wrong. She should cut it. Better double knot it now. Keep these safe. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Can even put that on there if you want. Can someone say Pinterest? You want to win one of these? Well, all you have to do is bring your information down, a business card, your email address, to Johnson Brothers, or you could email Rick at rick at rickdancer.com. And good luck. They're gorgeous. <laughs> While we're out at Johnson Brothers, I figured I'd ask some uh, vegetable questions. How, when, and what? What are these? Okay, so cold crops like lettuce, 
Um, you can do onions now. We have really nice like mixes, gourmet mixes, which basically all you need is salad dressing. Beans and peas, those can go out right now. Peppers and tomatoes love heat. So if it gets really cold, they're not gonna do well. In terms of tomatoes, is it better to hang them upside down or plant them right side up? It depends on your space and know what you have available. What time um, of year is the best? Well, generally, rule of thumb is May 15th is the last day of frost. So if you have a cold frame or if you want to plant it outside, you can. I would just definitely cover it with a harvest guard. You know it all. The <laughs> veggie girl. So there's a whole bunch of new restaurants and places to drink in town that we need to tell people about. The First International Tap House is on the corner of Willamette and Broadway, one of the oldest buildings in Eugene, and they have all kinds of beer. Now, just down the street over in the Whitaker neighborhood, Oakshire Brewery has a new public house. Should it's I be a, writing this down? You should. It's across the street from the Wandering Goat. Then there's the Beer Stein. They have new digs. A big building in the old l and market. And I, I was afraid they were going to lose some of their charm when they opened this bigger place, but they didn't. We went there the other night. It's awesome. Eeb Hamid, the owner of Soraya Cafe, has just opened Dahlia on Broadway. It's in the old Xenon, and they have excellent food, and he's a great guy. It's Lebanese food. And then there's a new Vietnamese-French restaurant called Ban Mi. It's in the old Hawthorne Cafe, also on, my broad, on Broadway, right down the street from the Dahlia. Then over in Springfield, there's Willie's. Mookie's, it's on International Way, has now been turned into Willie's. Willie used to have a restaurant here in town many, many years ago, and so he's back. So that's good news. Willie's back. Um, you know what? Sounds like I've got some eating and reviewing to do. I really liked my first assignment, the Ranchito Grill on Mohawk next to the McDonald's. You know that? Good, you know where it is. I Bring me there. Is. Let's go. Drop me off and or buy me a drink. I don't know. They and, make excellent fajitas. And tell Abe that we sent you. Do Watch. that. So we make our food from scratch. And people that we have as employees, they really care about how the, the, the food tastes. So they make sure that it's really good, authentic Mexican food. The only Americanized part, you know, on these recipes are the melted cheese over. Because uh, people here like the melted cheese, you know. And in Mexico, we don't use that. But uh, the, the flavor, in the recipes and the ingredients, we use, you know, all Mexican uh, ingredients. But uh, the only thing is uh, Americanized is just to melt the cheese over. The water cooler is brought to you by McKinsey Mist Naturally Pure Artesian Water. What does that mean? The water just comes bubbling up from some property up around the McKinsey. They don't have to put anything in it. And just as important, they don't have to take anything out of it. A lot of bottled waters come from city water sources and they have to fix it before they bottle it. I don't want that, do you? And welcome to the water cooler. Joining us is Brian Obi, and you have proposed, the owner of Fifth Street Market, and you proposed this huge project, which is kind of fun to have it right here behind our water cooler. What is it, what is this going to be, Brian? Kind of describe uh, it for people. First, thank you, Rick, for your interest. And in, this is going to be truly an urban living development uh, an opportunity for people in Eugene <clears throat> that really heretofore they have not. Um, we found great success with the market and then success with the hotel and it become obvious that people are enjoying this area, all the restaurants, the entertainment, the things to do. And so we want to create a opportunity for people to live here. Uh, Karen and I live uh, in this particular area. We enjoy it. We think uh, the rest of the community will enjoy it. and. Uh, it's really that simple. In an area that uh, is, uh, is truly a market district, we would, would hope to have the farmer's market involved. We hope to have artists involved and entertainers. And uh, You're talking about a grocery store there. as well, too, aren't you? Yeah, we'd anticipate that there would be a market and uh, a grocery store type, if you will, that uh, would be unique to this area and would you know, hopefully add more impetus for more residential development in that part of the world. So you would have in this, as I understand the proposal, some high-end housing, some high-end condominium type things, and then also some, some moderately priced housing for the people who actually work at the market to be able to live and stay all in the same area, very sustainable community you'd be creating. That's correct. We have um, a partnership with uh, the Lane Housing Authority. 
uh, where they would provide workforce housing, and this is where people that are working, that have jobs, need a place to live, perhaps they can walk to work, those kind of things, uh, it will be integrated into the rest of the project. And it'll be multiple levels of, of housing. Certainly it goes from workforce to penthouse, but there'll be uh, uh, you know, small units and large units, and just the opportunity for uh, people in Eugene to come together in, in a variety of ways. So the county owns the land, you'll lease it for 99 years. How much do you expect this whole project to cost? Do you have any idea? Uh, it is estimated that uh, it is somewhere around $75 million, and that will depend on how many units, how many square feet of retail space, et cetera, et cetera, as, as we develop it. And you have other investors involved with this project? Uh, at this point, we do not. We anticipate that there will be. Uh, that is our style. There are other people that seem to want to, to invest in it and carry on from what we've done at the market. You think Eugene can handle something like this, Brian? I think Eugene's going to love this. It is a, a, a real game changer as to living opportunities in this community. I mean, this is uh, going to be an opportunity for people that live in a urban village, if you will, in a very urban kind of setting and uh, where the, the, you know, the sounds, the streets, and et cetera, are around you, but so are a lot of restaurants and nightclubs and shed entertainment, Cuthbert that you walk to. Uh, we walk to athletic events all the time at the university, walk to the halt. This will be a phased in project too. You think how long would this whole thing take? I, I expect that, uh, and it is my hope, that we within two years we would break ground and um, for at least the uh, major part of the project, uh, it would be completed within a year thereafter. All right. Brian Obi, thanks for coming in and talking with us Thank on the water. Thank you for having cooler. me. Yeah, this is going to be fun to watch it happen. Got to get out my soapbox just for a minute. What oftentimes happens with a project like this is there'll be public hearings. The opponents will come out in full force and only their story is heard because people who support a project like this stay home thinking, I don't need to say anything. You do need to say something. Everybody needs to be involved in the process. Okay, I'm done. Hey, I want to be sure and thank Matt Sprick with Pacific Northwest Publishing. They're letting us use that cool window on the side of their building they just remodeled right next to 6th Street Grill across the street from the Hult Center. Thanks, Matt. If Rick asks, he didn't see me. Just down the street from Johnson Farms is Dietering Orchards. Now, Dietering Orchards is going to open early this year, June the 1st, and they're going to have a big grand reopening on June the 8th. June the 8th is the anniversary of Roger Dietering's passing. Last fall, we went out to the farm and did a story on the orchard. Dietering Orchards near Coburg is more than a farm. Dietering Orchards is a way of life. My uh, great-grandparents, William and Julia, moved into the area back in 1911. The Dieterings want their way of life to become part of your life. In the 30s, the family grew row crops and rhubarb. Dietering's grandfather, a five-term state legislator in Oregon, had an idea to enhance the farm. Somewhere in the 40s, he decided he was going to grow peaches. And most of the farmers around here kind of laughed at him. But peaches caught on, and Dietering's was famous for growing what no one else could grow in the Willamette Valley. And at times, there would be rows of cars almost a mile out down the street back in the heavy canning days because people wanted to get peaches and there was nowhere else to get it. Roger and Sharon Dietering, Greg's parents, put apples and education into the farm mix. When they start with the gravin scenes, go into the cameo, the matsu, the king, um, one of the everybody's favorite is the honey crisp. 36 varieties, some on the trees until December, available for sale most of the year. Roger wanted school kids to touch and feel and experience the farm. He pushed the high season from summer into the fall. You pick or pick it out yourself at the historic farm stand. You get to choose. But everyone walks away with the best produce in the valley and a better understanding of life on the farm. He had strong focus on education, really had a heart to educate the young people to understand nature and farming, where our food comes from. 
So he started doing a lot of field trips out here. Field trips are still a regular part of the experience at Dietering Orchards. Pumpkins and apples, row crops, corn so crisp the sound whispers as it's shucked. At Dietering Orchards, change is part of history and more is coming. The next generation of Dieterings is moving into agro-recreation. He uh, moved the, the farm into a whole another season. We'd actually move, like to move it into a full year-round kind of operation. Dietering Orchards will still have all the fresh produce you count on, but enhanced with more activities and more ways to keep you entertained on the farm. Cider. We make cider out of every kind of apple. At Dietering Orchards, you get to be a part of the farm experience. It's all fresh. It's fresh, natural, there's nothing added to it. It's just literally just apples squeezed. I think my dad would be pretty surprised at uh, what we're doing. Uh, but he would be happy about it. He would be happy that the next generation is bringing some other new ideas into the operation and enhancing it uh, to carry this on. That's, that's the thing he'd be happiest about, just to see that his life's work is being carried on into the next generations. At Dietering Orchards, you experience life in the country, life on the farm, and food gathering the way it's been done for generations. Dietering Orchards is not going away. Dietering Orchards is here to stay. Dietering Orchards is really going to focus on agro-recreation. What does that mean? They bring out animals for the kids to pet. They're going to have a farm-themed playground. They're also going to have the cider barn open where they'll have cider, snacks, coffee. And then they're going to have that world-famous apple launcher. Yeah, well, the apples aren't in season yet, so what are they going to do? Improvise with water balloons. Do that at your own risk. Here's their hours. I do some work with the Look Me in the Eye campaign, and the purpose is to look people in the eye, people with disabilities, to see them as a person, not just a disability. But you know, the purpose really is bigger than that. It's really about seeing all of us and accepting each of us for who we are. We were at Spring Creek Elementary the other day. I was with a young man named Nick Casa. He was explaining to the kids what it's like to have a wheelchair to get around. The kids were asking great questions, and this one little boy came up, let's just call him John, and John said, my issue is that people think I'm odd and they tell me that to my face. And I said, how does that make you feel? And he said, really bad. After the assembly, I'm leaving and John looks at me and he just mouths the words, thank you. Got in my car and I said, you know what? I want to be like John when I grow up. I think I need to just start being odd and not worry about what the rest of you think. We'll see you next time. <laughs>